You are what you see in one sense. If you see the half glass full, if you call it half full, you're an optimist. The pessimist sees the glass, of course, as half empty. The philosopher just says the glass is too big. And if you are a penny pincher, like my wife, you ask if there are free refills. There are four different people. They're all looking at the same glass, the same thing. But there are four responses because the people are different, not the glass. What they see reveals more about them than it does about the contents of the glass. It's as if all of life is a Rorschach test that in the end tells us much more about the seer than it does the ink blot itself. You are what you see in an empty tomb. It defines you. No matter what you see, the tomb is still empty. Some look at an empty tomb and just see a hole in a rock. And they live their life and say, so what? Others see an empty grave and they assume the worst. There is a missing corpse. Others see the miracle of miracles that unwinds all of the penalties of sin and death in a fallen world and see the highlight of history. Today, Easter Sunday, you are what you see in an empty tomb. So I ask you today, what do you see in an empty tomb? Today we turn to John chapter 20. And I want you to know that ordinary biographies don't have a John chapter 20. In John chapter 19, Jesus died. And that's the end of the story for most people. But with Jesus, John chapter 19 is not the end of the story. There is a John chapter 20. And so it starts in John 20, verse 1, on the first day of the week in the New King James, the ESV and most other versions include a connecting word, but, now, and, because it is connected to John chapter 19. The connecting word, and, but, now, says this is just like the previous chapter. It's not all of a sudden going to fairy tale uh, once upon a time. This is continuing the narrative of a real life. And so on the first day of the week, notice Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb. There is no account in John 19 or 20 of the actual resurrection. Mary comes to an empty tomb. There is no account of the resurrection in Matthew, Mark, or Luke either. There was no one there to see it. All four Gospels just tell us about the empty tomb. There's no special effects, just a simple account of what they found, an empty tomb. Very matter of fact, there's no trumpet or angels, at least yet, just the result. We don't see the risen Lord, we just see an empty tomb. And friends, that's all we sometimes get, right? We get there after something happens, and we just get to hear eyewitness testimony, but this is what they actually saw. They saw an empty tomb. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. Some of you came this morning at 6.30 to a sunrise service before the sun rose while it was still dark. Mary came, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us there were others. John only mentions Mary, although she hints later when she says, we, can't, we don't know where they took him. But here is the first witness, so to say, still in the dark in more ways than one. On the way, they were wondering about who would move the stone. But when they got there, they saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. They arrived not to just see it rolled away, but this word here is violently taken away somewhere off the tracks. These roll, these well, stones would be circular, and so with one or two strong guys, you could roll them. But this one wasn't just rolled on the tracks. It was picked up and moved far away as if something happened. So what did Mary see? What did she assume she was seeing? She saw not even the empty tomb. She just saw the stone rolled away. 
So what happens if the stone is rolled away? She assumes the tomb is empty. She assumes that A, some grave robbers came and maybe they thought they'd find some riches in a rich tomb. Only rich people would be buried in a cave like this. Or maybe she assumes the enemies of Jesus came to further desecrate the body. But seeing just the stone rolled away, we learn, she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, John, whom Jesus loved. John tells us he's the one that Jesus loved. And she said to them, is she running with good news? He's alive or with bad news? They've taken, well, what she says tells us a lot about her. She gets to interpret what she has seen. She has seen, perhaps, she's looked in the empty tomb. Why was she the first one to get to Simon, Peter, and John? Maybe she's the only one who went. Maybe she was the fastest. Maybe she was the youngest. Maybe because the rest were grandmothers. Or maybe the rest didn't go with her. Someone had to go and tell Mary, the mother of Jesus. But she tells them what she saw. They have taken away the Lord of, out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid them. And so, let's give her some credit. She still calls him Lord. But she assumes they have taken his body. She says, we don't know. Did she see anyone take the body? How does she know it was more than one person? She's assuming. But she says they couldn't just let him rest in peace. They had to take his body. So here's the question. What did Mary see in an empty tomb? Tragically, Mary saw a tragedy. Isn't that itself a tragedy? She saw only what was missing. She missed what was there. There was something in the tomb, not Jesus' body. And that just compounds the problem. She sees that, and so it's a self-fulfilling tragedy. Have you ever wished for something you didn't have, didn't see? A newer car, a nicer home, a better preacher, and then miss the one you had? Well, don't be thinking about the newer car, the newer home, the better preacher, and miss the one you had. The problem for Mary was she was looking for a dead body. And she couldn't find the dead body. She was assuming it was still a dead body. She was looking for the wrong thing. She interprets the Lord's work for them. You know, they, the anonymous they. You know what they say? No, I've never met them. What do they say? I've only met you and them and them, but I've never met they. Remember in the story of Joseph, which we're studying on Sunday mornings right now, in chapter 50, Joseph doesn't say to his brothers, you sold me into slavery. He says, what you meant for evil, you did it. God meant for good. Joseph saw God behind the scenes. She in misinterprets history's greatest joy, Jesus' body is raised, for a tragedy, which is a tragedy. To her credit, she calls him Lord, even though she thinks he's dead. But the truth is, he is Lord, whether you admit he is or not. No matter what you think about him, he is alive, no matter what you assume. Mary's problem, why does she see in the empty tomb a tragedy? Well, first I would say because she expected the wrong thing. She expected the wrong thing. Mary Magdalene, according to Mark 16, 1, with Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him as king? No. They came to anoint his body for burial. Do you remember the blind beggar in Acts chapter 3? After the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, Peter and John are walking into the temple in Jerusalem, and he's begging, and he's begging, and Peter and John look at him and say, oh, gold and silver, have we none? When they said, look at us, he gave them his attention. Oh, here's some customers. They're going to give me money. He was expecting to receive something from them. He was expecting to receive some spare change. He wasn't expecting to have his life changed. And that's what they, they gave him. They gave him his sight. But the question is, what do you see? He wanted, Peter wanted to give him so much more than just spare change. Mary's problem was not only that she expected the wrong thing, 
She focused on the wrong thing. It's not just what you see, it's what you look at, it's what you focus on. In a room full of people, you might focus on one person. You might not look on a person, you might look on details, on things. Here, she focused on, she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. We're not even told she looked into the tomb. Maybe she just assumed the body was gone. But the truth is, she focused on the wrong thing. Do you remember in Numbers chapter 13? This is a great story. I can't wait to share it with you. Numbers 13 is the story of the unfaithful spies who went into the Holy Land, into the land flowing with milk and honey. Come back and bring us a report, not whether we can beat them, but maybe how we can beat them. They come back and they say, all the people whom we saw, what did they see? All the people we saw in the land were men of great stature. We saw giants. They didn't see opportunities. They didn't see milk and honey. They saw obstacles, not opportunities. What a tragedy. They were focusing on the wrong thing. They said, don't go in. The giants are too big. The Davids of this world would tell you that giant's not too big to hit. That giant's too big to miss. Our God is bigger than those giants. Mary's problem, not only she expected the wrong thing and focused on the wrong thing, but I could suggest she was running with the wrong crowd. She ran to Peter and John, and they weren't exactly pillars of faith at this time either. They weren't waiting at the tomb for Jesus' resurrection. They were hiding for their lives. We are all somewhat subject to peer pressure. But she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and this is her peer group. You know, we say, everyone's saying, and so we have to maybe change what we are thinking or what we are doing because of what everyone's saying. Mary came, and she was with some clueless women. Where did she run? To some clueless men who don't believe that Jesus is arisen. That's why they're hiding in the upper room. Do you remember what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33? Evil company corrupts bad habits. You know, the people you hang around with are very important because they just might change the way you act, the way you think, the way you are. You are who you see. Not only what you see, but the people you see all the time are going to have a greater effect on you than you may realize. So be careful who you run with. Mary ran to Peter and John. Mary's problem might also be that she assumed the worst. You see, she said, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. She didn't see anyone move Jesus' body. She's assuming someone came and stole the body. She's made up a story in her mind. You know, I was very young, and I was in my first job after a, a year of college, and I went to my boss, and I used the wrong word. I said, well, I assume, and my boss taught me a lesson about the word assume. He said, you know what you do when you assume? I didn't know. He says, well, you take the first th three letters of assume, and you make one of them out of you and me, the last three letters of assume. So I still have made some bad assumptions since then, but I've, ever, I've learned not to use the word assume, lest someone tell me that. She never saw this happen. But at that point, what she saw defined her. She was a frightened person. She saw tragedy because she was looking for a tragedy. She assumed one had happened. They did this, they did that. Don't let a fictional them run your life and define your life. You know, my favorite saying, and I've probably quoted it at least a dozen times in my four short months here, but my favorite quote in life is, the tragedy of life is not what happens to us, but what we miss. And she missed out on so much because she missed what was still in the empty tomb. She says, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Well, isn't that sad? She expected the wrong thing, a dead body. She focused on the wrong thing, the stone rolled away. She ran with the wrong crowd, not a bunch of people who said, don't worry about it, Jesus has got it. She assumed the worst. What she says about him, he's dead, his body is stolen, doesn't change who Jesus is, he's alive. It changes who she is. It changed her. 
So can I ask you one more time, what do you see in an empty tomb? There is a continuing person in the story we want to pick up in verse 3. She told Peter, remember? Peter, therefore, went out, and the other disciple, John, and they were going to the tomb. So they both ran together. You know, two men have got to compete. And so they said, I'll race you. Last one there is a rotten egg. And John does get there first, and he sure tells us that he came to the tomb first. Is Peter older? More out of shape? The two can encourage each other. If you run with somebody, it's easier to keep on going. John outran Peter, and he probably made Peter run faster. God does want us to go with two or three witnesses because we can encourage each other. But in verse 5, when he, John, the faster disciple, when he got there, he stooping down and looking in, he didn't just look at the door and turn around, he looked in and he saw the linen cloths that Mary missed lying there, yet he did not go in. So Peter out dares John and he rushes right in, he goes in. John didn't go in, but what was not missing was the grave clothes that Jesus was wrapped in. That was there. Verse 6, Peter just barged right in. Peter came in second, following him, John reminds us, and went into the tomb. He went in. He dared go where John didn't go. Maybe he was waiting for Peter, or maybe it was a holy place that he didn't want to go in. But they both saw what Mary missed. And Peter saw the linen cloth lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. So here's what they see. They see two witnesses. God always wants two or three witnesses, so he sends Peter and John. But they see two witnesses, the grave clothes, which are all wrapped up in a shell, but kind of like a deflated balloon. It's as if Jesus just kind of passed through the grave clothes. I mean, you don't wrap no body. No one takes the body out and then wraps it back up again. He sees the grave clothes lying there. That doesn't make sense. But the linen cloth that was over his face, that is separated over to the side and it's folded. So what Peter saw, he didn't see Jesus, which is probably what he was looking for. He was probably like Mary looking for a body. He was disappointed, but maybe just because his expectations weren't high enough. Why did he not get it? Well, John explains, as yet, they did not, and he says this about himself as well, they did not know the scripture yet, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. So imagine walking into the empty tomb, seeing Jesus' empty grave clothes. How did he get out? How did someone steal his body and leave the grave clothes? Neither of them really got it yet at this point, didn't register, but especially Peter. What did Peter see in an empty tomb? Mary saw tragedy, but do you know what Peter saw? He saw a mystery. He didn't quite get it. He didn't assume the worst, but he didn't know what was going on. Something obviously happened here, but he has no clue. Peter, who is always quick to talk, quick to speak up, volunteer. He's quick to put his foot in his mouth. Peter is one who usually make things happen. But here, he doesn't make things happen. Some make things happen. Some watch things happen. That's not usually Peter. But Peter this time falls into a third group. Some people just wonder what happened. And that's what Peter does. He doesn't make things happen. He doesn't watch things happen. He just wonders what happens. That's not usually him. He's not usually a bystander, but some people bless their hearts. That's all they do. What happened here? Many people today encounter the empty tomb, and like Peter that day, they just scratch their heads and say, oh well, and they go back home. You know what Peter's problem is? Peter, I would suggest to you, didn't try hard enough. Did he have enough information? I think he did. It says that Peter was outrun by John. Does that mean that Peter walked? 
or just jogged. I don't know, maybe he didn't run as fast as John. But what I'm suggesting to you is maybe he didn't think hard enough. Remember what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 29? You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Did Peter search for Jesus with all of his heart? He went to the empty tomb. Well, check that off the box. But did he put two and two together? Peter's problem, I would suggest, he didn't look closely enough. He saw linen cloths lying there. He saw the handkerchief that had been around his head. And it wasn't lying with a linen cloths. It was folded together on the other side. He saw, but he didn't see like John saw. John saw, but Peter missed it. John saw that, but he goes, well, what, what does that mean? And he doesn't try and figure it out. And I think a deeper problem is he didn't go deep enough. He didn't know the scripture. Was it that he could not know? I challenge you, the next time you read through one of the, the Gospels, underline or highlight the times that Jesus says, we're going to Jerusalem now, where the Son of Man will be betrayed and crucified and rise the third day. Five, six, seven times Jesus says, I will go, I will die, I will rise again the third day. Peter shouldn't be surprised. John shouldn't have been surprised. They should have been waiting outside the tomb on the third day. But they weren't there. They didn't get it. They could have known. They should have known. And then I would say maybe his greatest problem was he didn't wait long enough. The disciples went away again to their homes. Now I'm not saying camp out there and move into the empty tomb. But why leave? Why not wait for a minute? If he waited for a few minutes, he would have met who Mary met. Mary went back to the tomb. Where else is she going to go? Natural place to go. And she met Jesus. Oh, she mistook him for the gardener at first, maybe because of the tears in her eyes. But Peter left, and that's a tragedy. He could have seen the risen Christ if he would have gone back. If you are at the empty tomb, don't be too quick to leave because you just might miss the risen Jesus. You see, from Peter we learn, never be too quick to leave an empty tomb. What a tragedy. Peter, yes, maybe didn't try hard enough, look close enough, go deep enough, but the greatest tragedy was he didn't wait long enough. Go back to your home, but if you do, we are at a place today where the tomb is still to this day empty. We can't prove the resurrection, but we can prove you can't find his body. And if we can't find it, think about the contemporaries of Jesus. The Jews were very motivated to produce a body of Jesus to prove the resurrection untrue. The Romans were very motivated to prove the resurrection untrue. If they couldn't find the body of Jesus, we certainly can't find it today. The tomb was certainly empty. So let me ask you again, what do you see in an empty tomb? Maybe you come in today innocently and you just say, I don't know what happened. Obviously, something happened, but like Peter at this point, you're saying, it's a mystery. One more, the other disciple in verse 4. We've got to trace not just Peter's story, but John's story. You know, the other disciple who outran Peter, the one who came to the tomb first, that's John. He stooped down, he looked in, he saw the linen cloths. Maybe he didn't go in because he knew this was a holy place, but after Peter went in, he went in and he saw and he saw, and he believed. John's a different story. He saw the same thing that Mary missed. He saw the same thing that Peter saw, but he actually saw it. And that made all the difference in him. You see, Mary saw a tragedy. Peter saw a mystery. But John saw the same thing, and he saw a victory. John looked into an empty tomb, and he believed. He got goosebumps and said, wait a minute. I remember what Jesus said. Wait a minute. The grave clothes lying there. He thought, wait a minute. What happened here? Nobody broke in here and stole Jesus' body. Who would steal the body and take the time to unwrap the body and then wrap them back up? 
A thief would be in too much of a rush. A friend wouldn't want to carry away the body naked. Who would do that? In verse 6, we see he saw and he believed. But remember John 20, 29, later in this chapter, Jesus says to these disciples, Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. John had not seen Jesus yet, but he believed. He saw the grave clothes like a deflated balloon. He saw the spices still in there. Somehow Jesus made a Houdini escape. He saw the handkerchief. And the handkerchief wasn't there where it would have been on the dead body as if Jesus just passed through the grave clothes and left them there. Well, what's the napkin doing over here? The napkin was folded, perhaps in a special way. If it was a crime scene, then the grave clothes probably wouldn't have been taken. But if it was a crime scene, if it was a thief, neither would have been folded. A thief would have been getting out of there as quick as they could. If it was a hoax, someone trying to pretend that Jesus was alive, then they both would have been folded. But how do you explain the handkerchief folded and put aside by itself? You know what Jesus did the very first thing he did when he was raised from the dead? He folded a napkin. And that dignifies our little minor tasks. You've got guests coming for Easter. A lot of people worked very hard to host a breakfast this morning and folded napkins and, and made breakfast. Jesus dignifies our little tasks by folding this napkin. But he didn't just fold the napkin because he's a neat neck who does everything decently and in order, 1 Corinthians 14, 40. He did it, I believe, as a sign to John. That's Jesus. Do you know Jesus well enough to recognize his hand in your life? John saw the napkin fold and said, it's just like Jesus. To roll the stone away, it's just like Jesus. I, he left that there just for me. He saw and he believed. You know, the word here that John saw is a different word for what Mary saw. In the Greek, there are several different words for seeing, for what they saw. And Mary saw, it's just the common word for what you see. What did you see when you were there? Here, Mary's saw was like an eye chart. Peter, when he saw, in verse 6, the Greek word is a, a word you know. It's theater. Theater comes from this word, what you go to see, a movie in the theater. Or we could even get theory out of it. Peter saw it and he theorized, but he didn't come up with anything. But the Greek word for see, saw, in verse 8 from John, is another Greek word you know. It's idea. And John got it. He got the idea. Have you ever said the word see in that context? Oh, I see. I see. What does that mean? Doesn't mean I see. Blind people use those words. Oh, I see. Ironic? No, that's the way we use it. I understand. And John looked and he got it. He saw. He got the idea. He reminds me of Elisha. Great story in 2 Kings chapter 6. Elisha and his servant are surrounded by a bunch of armies. And the servant comes to tell Elisha, we're surrounding Elisha and his knees are knocking. And Elisha says, relax, there's more of us than there are of them. And the servant looks at him and says, have you counted us recently? There's two of us, there's hundreds of them. And Elisha says, relax, God's got it. I love it. He says, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. He saw the mountain full of houses, of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Elisha didn't need God to open his eyes. He didn't say, Lord, open our eyes. He knew God had it. He said, open his eyes so he can see what he needs to see to have faith. I don't need to see that. He saw, but he didn't see. He believed without seeing. Elisha could be praying that prayer for you today. Lord, open their eyes that they might see. Beautiful new praise song. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. That's what we need. We need eyes to see like Elisha and like John. John saw an empty tomb, and that was all he needed. That's a victory. 
Jesus is not here. He's not dead. He's assuming not the best. He's assuming the truth. You see, John saw that truth is eternal. Nail it to a cross, wrap it in grave clothes, seal it in a tomb. The truth crushed to the earth will rise again. I put that quote in your study sheet if you want it. The truth is eternal, whether you believe it or not. Nail it to a cross, wrap it in grave clothes, seal it in a tomb. No problem. Truth crushed to the earth will rise again. John saw that our deepest questions have answers. And so for the widow, there is comfort at a fresh grave. For a young couple that loses their baby, their child, there is hope. For the newlywed missionary who is martyred, for the teen killed by a drunk driver, there is an empty tomb that proves there is the possibility of a victory. Yes, Mary saw a tragedy. Peter saw a mystery. But John saw a victory. And this is not an eye test. This is a heart test. What do you see? John looked into an empty grave and he saw. He saw that God gets the last word on sin and death. Don't worry about it. God's got it. He looked into the empty tomb and he saw more than slightly used grave clothes and a folded napkin. He saw a tomb that was full of hope, hope enough for all the world. So one final time, I ask you, what do you see in an empty tomb? When a Beethoven symphony is played, it is not under judgment. If you think it's ugly, that's a reflection on you. If you think it's beautiful, that's a reflection on you. Beethoven's no longer on trial. When you go to see some modern art, you say, I could have done that blindfolded. But when you go to see a Michelangelo sculpture, Michelangelo is not on trial. If you say, I could do that, I'd say, show me. If you say, that's ugly, that's a reflection on you. If you say it's beautiful, that means you recognize the truth. It's beautiful. When you stand before the empty tomb, that is God's masterpiece. And the empty tomb is not on trial. It is empty no matter what you say or no matter how many people say it doesn't matter. The truth is, it matters more than anything. Life is not a meaningless accident, an explosion, a big bang. It is meaningful because a person with a purpose created it, and it's all about you. He made us to love him, and there is hope for us because he lives. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the empty tomb. Lord, I pray if there's a Mary or a Peter here this morning who doesn't quite get it, who doesn't see, Lord, I pray that every person this morning is a John, that we see, even though we don't see, we believe For, Lord, the tomb is empty because you are alive and in heaven. We thank you for that good news. We thank you that the cross is empty, that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And, Lord, we look forward to the day when he comes again. But right now, we, our knees bow, our tongues confess that Jesus is Lord, the risen Lord, and we thank you for his life. Lord, I pray that today, if there's one who's never trusted in Christ, I pray that today they will come to the place where they will accept your gift of forgiveness that is freely offered at Calvary's cross. Lord, I pray that that person who doesn't know you might right now in their heart say something like this to you and mean it. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself, but I believe you died for me, and I believe you rose from the dead. I believe you're alive. I want you to give me new life. Make me the person you want me to be. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. But the good news is, while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us, and we are saved by faith. Those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Did you just call on the name of the Lord right now? Did you just pray that prayer for the first time and mean it? 
I would love to pray for you. Would you check off the first box? With your head's still bowed, your eyes still closed. Would you check off that first box on the bottom that says, I prayed to receive Christ this morning for the first time and I meant it. I'd love to pray for you. If you didn't and you need to, would you please see me today? Would you please give me a call? Send me an email. Lord, I pray for those of us, your children. May we be quick to assume the best when it comes to you. Lord, we pray that you will help us to see your hand when we can't always see the results beforehand. Lord, help us to be quick to share the good news that Jesus is alive. And because Jesus is alive, there's hope in this dying world. Lord, we live in troubled times, but they're not too troubled for you. Lord, we thank you that you are bigger than the problems and greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Lord, I thank you for new life. And Lord, I pray for everyone here to experience that new life. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We're going to stand together and sing a great song, He is Lord. Sing through it twice. It's a great resurrection song. He is risen from the dead and He is Lord. Do you believe it? Let's sing that together. <laughs>